Welcome, Professor Tajal Khazin. Is that the right pronunciation, Professor? Yes, that's fine. Okay, sure. brilliant. We, we're really delighted to be able to host you today uh, on you. this very interesting issue, very vital issue of, the, of South Sudan's water resources. May I begin by welcoming you and asking you to introduce yourself to our audience? I am Tajal Khazin. Uh, I am a trained engineer by, uh, by profession. I got my undergraduate uh, credentials from the University of Khartoum in Sudan, and then I got my postgraduate from the United States. And uh, then I veered mostly into conflict, conflict management and water resources in the Horn of Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, I was a, a professor at the Institute of African Studies at Carleton University, one of our best universities in Canada, for a term of five years. I'm retired now, and I am a senior fellow at the Norman Patterson School for International Affairs and a member of the board of directors of the Archaeological Institute of America, the Ottawa chapter. And I have been with Nile Waters uh, in the Lakes region and the Horn of Africa for about 50 years now. Oh, that's brilliant. Uh, that's really good to hear. Uh, can I assume, can we assume that you are Sudanese yourself by origin? Yes, yes, absolutely. My, uh, my uh, uh, nationality of origin is, uh, is Sudanese, but I am an honorary citizen of South Sudan as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Can you give us a, a brief description of the Sud region and the South Sudan's ecosystem generally? Right. I will take you to the spider and to the web. Both of them are important. The spider is important and the web is important. There is no spider without the web. If you look at the cross section of the Nile flow, there is a dip in that cross section between Mongala and Malakal. So water six is on level. I mean, since secondary school, we have been told that. Yeah. So the water is flowing from Kagera going down to the Delta. This is the only place in the entire Nile run of 6,000 kilometers where you have that dip. So the dip needs to be filled with water before the rest of the water flows over. That is the suit. It is that dip in Mashar swamps, which is in the east, and then on Bahar al-Ghazali stamps with Shar on the west. Without that dip, there will be no soot. However, the soot is not just swamps. The soot is an integrated ecosystem. And this is where the danger of tampering with it comes. You never know what will happen if you touch area A and it is linked to area B, what is going to happen in area B? that has to be studied before anybody touches it. It is a mass of water occupying anywhere between 30,000 square kilometers to 70,000 square kilometers, depending on the rainy season and the dry season. Quite a bit of livelihood of the people in South Sudan is actually dependent on the suit. If it is fish, if it is hunting for crocodiles, but most importantly, it is the uh, touch. The people, the Dinkas, the Nuers, and others, they move east and west. They depend on the touch. When it recedes, there is grass, so there is grass and water. So that human system will also be deterred if we tamper with it. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. What is the jungle canal? The Jongle Canal was very sort of and produced in documents between 1904 and 1907. And it was produced by a British engineer who was in charge of the waterworks in Egypt. At that time, Egypt was uh, physically colonized by Great Britain. 
because of the Suez Canal and the debt and whatever have you. Uh, there was a king, there was this and that. However, all the decision making and all the senior posts were in the hands of the British until the amounts of money in the sterling pounds of debt were to be settled. And as you know, this went on until 1936, the famous agreement signed between Bevan and Nahaz Basha uh, in, in, in the UK. So the, the basic idea is Egyptian under the flag, under the umbrella, under the knowledge of Great Britain. The detailed concept was developed by the Brits, by the Egyptians in 1946. From then on, it became serious. That's, that's generally the background. The idea is to bypass the marshes, which will drain all this water in the marshes. In a little while, they will dry out and let the water pass and go through the White Nile. And the reason for that is to save between 4 billion cubic meters of water to 10 billion cubic meters of water, depending on how much you drain. There is Jungle one concept and Jungle two concept, two different concepts. And Maulana Abilalair played a great role in improving the situation. And uh, if Egypt does that, if the canal is implemented, Egypt can cultivate an additional 2 million acres of land. And that's the primary objective of Yungule Canal, to drain the water from South Sudan, take it into the Nile, take it into Egypt, and do the cultivation. So the Yungule Canal is a siphoning system to take the water from the Sud and put it in the main stream of the Nile. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. And why was it dropped? Why, did not, why didn't the British implement it? Uh, at that time, there was no need for the water. Because if you go back to the 1929 Memorandum of Understanding between Egypt and uh, the UK, the Brits built Sinar Dam, and they completed the dam in 1925. The Egyptians refused to allow water to be stored behind the dam until 1929. So for four years, the Sudanese were looking at the dam, and no water was stored. Not benefiting from it. No. So after uh, British pressure, the Egyptians agreed to give Sudan 4 billion cubic meters of water, which is 5% of the discharge of the Nile. And uh, then came the high dam and the 1959 agreement, which took all the rights of the upstream countries, 100%, and divided them between Egypt and Sudan. The 1959 agreement talks about 85 billion cubic meters of water of discharge at Swan Dam. 18 and a half billion were the share of Sudan and 55 and a half billion were the share of Egypt. Not only that, not only that, to add insult to injury, the agreement says that any future increase from Lake Victoria, from wherever it is, any future increase on the Nile waters is to be, regardless where it is, is to be divided equally between Egypt and Sudan. So even if the increase is coming from Lake Victoria or Lake Tana or the Sud or wherever it is, you don't own it. The Lakes region people don't own it. It flows into the Nile. That's what the agreement says. Hila Selassie objected to it. And in those days, the Lakes region did not really uh, know that much. So it has a, a long history, and then in the uh, 80s, in the early 80s, a huge machine called the Rupel was brought from Pakistan. It was dredging in Pakistan, and the canal started. There were 70 kilometers left. Dr. John Garang did his dissertation on Jungle Canal. And Dr. John Garang gallantly, gallantly 
disabled the machine that was dredging and stopped the excavation of Junkulay Canal. It needs to go on record. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Until this day, the Junkulay Canal, the digging of Junkulay Canal has stopped uh, until um, what we fear might happen, which is maybe the South Sudanese government might, might change its mind at some point in the future. And that's why we are here. What, what benefit will can South Sudan get out of the digging of the jungle canal, if any? There are no benefits whatsoever. People are talking about blockage to navigation. This is completely different. If there is a blockage, you remove the blockage, but you do not unnecessarily deepen the passage of of the water and all the river transport corporation the old days of the old river old, uh, river uh, transport corporation they had their barges and what they called the sandal a tugboat and, and and a barge they were all designed on four feet depths of water that's it 120 centimeters and you can have navigation unless you want to bring a, a, a large boat the Nile is not meant for that. But the old barges carrying about seven or 800 tons and moving between Kosi and up to Juba, all they need is four feet depth of water. That's less than your or my neck. So there is no navigational benefit. There is no water benefit or water security uh, benefit. Uh, the the pass of the Nile can be cleaned if navigation becomes an issue, and I don't know where people do do they want to go. Now there is a road from Juba, you cross the bridge, and you can go up to the uh, 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 southern border of, of of Sudan. So I cannot see the value added of having navigation. But however, if you want to have a navigation, we can clear the pass and we can bring the old four feet kind of depths required for the for the barges and and that's it but there are no benefits whatsoever the losses is the disturbance of the ecosystem the losses which which, which will come to yeah mm. and the losses are the loss of the touch i mean the the people your your, your people who are rearing cattle will not be able to have their natural movement east and west. Thank you. That's right. Some people, including in South Sudan, believe that the building of the canal might lessen or might solve the problem of the floods. Is this true? No. In a nutshell, no. And floods are not particular to South Sudan. There was a tube station in London that was flooded. The south west of London continuously suffers from massive flooding. The British never thought of draining the rivers because there is flooding. The same goes to British Columbia now in Canada. We have unbelievable flooding. Around Texas, wherever you go, there is seasonal flooding. One, one year it comes, 10 years it does not come. Three years it comes, another five years it does not come. So this is an international weather phenomena. Floods have got absolutely nothing to do with running water. It has got absolutely nothing to do with the soot. One other thing that the people have been doing because of the closeness of the touch to the water, some of the pastoralists have settled in an area that used to be inundated with water. So naturally, when the river rises, they are going to have floods. But in the first place, they made a mistake by building their village close to the passage of the water. So there is no connection whatsoever. If you have got flooding, if it is repeated, you move the people rather than draining the water. If it is repeated, then you build dikes. And the dikes 
are built very easily through satellite imagery. We can command them to give us the information we want. And you bring caterpillar, D7s, D8s, scrapers, whatever have you. And you can build dikes and protect the, 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 the villages or, or the towns. So this is a fallacy. This is, this is not correct. There is no relationship whatsoever in the treatment of flooding. It's a completely different approach. And draining the water of the suit is not one of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Professor Touch. What's the difference? This is a technical question for the benefit uh, of, of our viewers. What's the difference between clearing, dredging, and draining the river? Right. Clearing, if you take the Sobat, for, in, for instance, the Sobat has got quite a bit of water high since now. All the Nile. I mean, this was uh, very many years back when a, a British person innocently brought one one plant of the water hyacinth. This is not an indigene of the Nile, and he really? threw it in. Yeah, and he threw okay. it in Lake Victoria. Okay. What you see now is from that one plant, that one British person who threw the plant of the water hyacinth in Lake Victoria. And then it is spread, and of course the Nile is flowing north, so the water hyacinths flows. When it comes to the suit, because of the dump in the profile, the water speed reduces and the water hyacinths stays on top. So clearing the water hyacinths can be done. It used to be done by the River Transport Corporation. So the problem of navigation is not new. So clearing the water hyacinths or the massive blocks of, of, of wood that have uh, 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 rested on the Sobat River, that's clearing. Cleaning the existing passage, but not deepening the river bed. So you remove the obstacles, and that's it. And the water is flowing. And then you have got dredging. So the cleaning, the clearing stroke cleaning does not affect the flow, does not drain the water. Dredging is when you bring track line equipment and you deepen the depths of the channel of the water. That's dredging. You are changing the natural profile, the natural depth, the natural condition of where the water flows. And that way, the water on the sides come to this deep channel. It reduces evaporation and it increases the discharge at whatever it is. In our case, it will be uh, uh, Egypt, the high dam in Egypt to be stored. And then the water of the Nile goes up to the Delta. And then draining is connected to dredging. When you dredge, automatically there is draining. The water that was on a wider area comes to a narrower but deeper channel and it flows, it flows fast. And once you do that, it is one way, it is irretrievable. You cannot stop it. The water is gone and gone forever. And how does this relate to the canal itself. The canal is another level of, 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 of uh, is, is even a more advanced, is a more crucial step beyond dredging. Right. The canal and dredging are two different things. The dredging is on the existing passage and channel of rivers or tributaries. The canal is bypassing all the marshes, Mashar, and Lake No, Al Ghazal Basin, bypassing all that, taking the water before the dump, before the dip in the profile, and taking it straight and completely draining or partially draining the swamps. So the canal is a tool to bypass the resting water or, or the dump where there is resting water 
and take the water from before that directly into the main run of the White Nile and straight into Egypt. This is going to drain the swamps and dry the swamps. That's the problem. It's not only drain. It will drain and that's it. The water is not going to be replenished. And that will give Egypt anywhere between 4 billion cubic meters to 10 billion cubic meters of water. And here, just let me add a little bit of, uh, of additional piece of information for the benefit of, of, of our listeners. Why is Egypt panicking now? The reason is the following. The 1959 agreement talks about 85 billion cubic meters discharge at a swan dam. 55 and a half of that goes to Egypt. Eight and a half billion, 18 and a half billion goes to Sudan. Sudan never used more than 12 billion cubic meters of water. So according to the 1959 agreement, six billion to six and a half billion cubic meters of water were going to Egypt every year free of charge. Now with the GERD, with the Ethiopian dam, massive dam, Sudan can agree with Ethiopia to store those 6 billion cubic meters of water for when they are needed. So Egypt now has it in, in its agricultural planning and agricultural usage. They have an extra 6 billion cubic meters of water that are not theirs and that Sudan can stop. So the Egyptians are trying their best to raise and replenish this six billion cubic meters that can be lost. Thank you. Why? Why had Sudan have to wait all these years uh, until the Ethiopian dam is done? What's the connection between the Ethiopian dam and um, the the usage of these six uh, million cubic meters that Sudan have not been able to use all this time? The the six the six six and a half billion cubic meters Sudan billion, has got billion. yeah mm. has got no control ha, did not have any use for it so everybody was closing his eyes and the water was flowing you cannot stop the water and the dam has and the Renaissance dam has given Sudan an opportunity to to to, to use store this extra? it to store it on request because you have a massive you have seventy four billion cubic meters oh okay of, they can of, of ask lake. Ethiopia to hold it back. Absolutely. Until they need it. Until Absolutely. Need it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So this is where the, 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 the panic is actually uh, coming from. And Okay. Okay. But this dredging that the South Sudanese government is talking about now, why do you think they are doing it? There is a reason that I can explain... Uh, overtly, and there is a reason why I should be very careful, and I will tell you both. Mm -hmm. One reason is there is what we call rights and benefits. Wherever you have got transboundary rivers originating from some place and going to some place, there is what we call rights and benefits. For argument's sake, 86 percent of the Nile discharges coming from Ethiopia they have 86% of the rights because the water is coming from their country. Now, if Ethiopia tomorrow decides to use all the Nile waters that's coming from the highlands into the lower lands, the Sudanese will die and the Egyptians will die first. So if there are rights and benefits, you need a trade-off. I am giving you my rights and the water in the Sud is the property of the people of South Sudan. This issue came during the CPA. The CPA, the Declaration of Principles was agreed in 1998 and the agreement was signed in 2005. The negotiations were going on for seven years. And then as you know, there was a transitional period. When the issue of the Nile waters came up, I was there. And it was a struggle. And finally, Dr. John Garang, in his wisdom at that time, 
he said, let us park this issue so that we don't create more controversy. Because the Egyptians were trying their best to sign on as members of the Lex region. Egypt is in the Mediterranean Sea and they wanted to sign on as members of the Lex region in the Nile Basin Initiative. Finally, through compromises, they were given observers status and they were happy with that, but they did not have voting rights. But anyway, when we came to the CPA, this issue was parked and they said, let us let, let the sleeping dogs uh, lie. So there is no benefit whatsoever. The government of South Sudan is literally bankrupt. The kitty is empty. And I think there are trade-offs, but they are very meager. A power station for WOW, a hospital in, uh, in Bor, a dispensary here. I, this is peanuts. That the Egyptians are offering uh, in, return for the, in return for the dredging. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So does this, this is, mean that the, the, are, the, the Egyptians are compromising on the canal? They're saying, okay, if they cannot get the canal now, so at least they, they could get the South Sudanese gov gov government to dredge the Nile, the White Nile. In, in a nutshell, yes. But there could be other reasons. There has been efforts before and bribes were paid. Uh, however, some good people managed to abort the earlier attempt in 2008, 2009. And uh, we need to be careful. We don't want to accuse people where we don't have evidence that we can take to court. No, but, no. I, but the Egyptians are going to do whatever it takes, if it is with the devil or the angels, to get more water. Okay. Isn't there a side effect as well? If the water is dredged and then you have these extra billions cubic, uh, cubic meter of water coming through Sudan. Can Sudan handle them? Isn't there another risk of flooding as well in North Sudan? The only obstacle is the capacity of Jabal Awliya Dam. It is the only dam within Sudan which is on the White Nile. The other dams are either on the Blue Nile or in tributaries like Adbara. So the water is flowing. That's not going to affect Sudan very much. But Sudan is going to have like a continuous flood. The channels in Sudan can take that flood. So I don't see uh, an imminent danger for additional water. And for 4 billion cubic meters, 5 billion cubic meters is not going to make that much uh, difference. Uh, Jabal Awliya Dam can be, can accommodate, they, they, they can change the spills or, the, or build more spills, but there are technical ways of taking the additional uh, discharge so that the water flows to Egypt. Once you go past Jabal Awliya, there is nothing else to stop uh, any additional water. Five, six, seven, eight billion cubic meters can pass through easily. The problem is that if the White Nile becomes a little bit wider, then the evaporation will increase in the northern parts of Sudan. Who takes that evaporation will be between Egypt and Sudan. Brilliant. Okay, uh, before we move on, you mentioned that the Jungle Canal will partly or wholly uh, drain the Sud region or, or the swamps. Um, and this will, will displace our people. It will, it will uh, destroy their pattern of, gra of grazing their animals and migration routes. Is there another side effect as well? Could the climate in South Sudan, the rainfall pattern on which we belong for other things, because South Sudanese don't just move their animals, they also cultivate crops. Could South Sudan be affected even areas beyond the Sud? Could they be affected uh, in, in terms of climate change as a result of canal or building the canal? If you talk to anybody from Western Equatoria, they will tell you that they never heard of uh, famine. They never heard of crops failing. All of Western Equatoria and Northern Uganda, where there are the Karamoja tribes, Karamoja cluster of tribes, that's called the Green Belt. The Green Belt is a direct and legitimate child of the Sud. The water evaporates from these 60, 30, 30,000 cubic uh, square kilometers to 70,000 square kilometers. It evaporates. The northern winds 
take the moisture and the rain drops in western equatoria and northern uganda you drain the swamps you drain the soot western equatoria will be like eastern equatoria where there are serious dry seasons and there are serious famines occasionally so that's one simple effect the other effect which is global methane is a gas that's not desired in the atmosphere and methane comes from cattle when they are digesting the the major source of methane is coming when the cattle are digesting and depending on the grass whatever have you is the quantity of methane this hub around the suit where we have millions and millions of cattle there is quite a bit of production of methane what are we going to do if the suit is drained and the cattle moves away are they going to pollute areas with methane while now it is concentrated so there is a, a, a dimension there the other dimension is that the suit is the largest wetland in africa and it is the Ramsar Reserve. Ramsar is the equivalent of UNESCO heritage. It is also a UNESCO heritage. So there's a dimension of international law that is invo involved. It's not just the government of Sudan, even if they want to do it, even if there are benefits, they have got to, if they want to be part of the international community, they have got to attend to international law. Uh, the other thing is fish. Right now, the fish does not know the depth. So it, it is the fish is proportionate to the surface area. If you have got two feet of water, you can have fish. And if you have got 20 feet of water, you can have fish. So if you reduce the surface area, you are reducing the area where the fish can actually live. Thank you. So Sudan is going to use, uh, is going to lose in many, many different ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, South Sudan has some of the largest cattle, goat, and sheep herds in the world. In addition, they also have wildlife. So the country also has a, a huge crop production potential. So besides the challenges that we have with transport infrastructure um, and, the, and the markets where we can sell South Sudanese uh, agricultural produces, and also the lack of modern technology, apart from these things, um, one of the problems that South Sudan has as well that is really prohibiting it to, to become uh, a major agricultural production country uh, is that we have an endless cycle of floods and, and droughts uh, in the country. Uh, is there a scientific or engineering solution that people can come with that can uh, solve this problem so our people can cultivate throughout the year that the water is available throughout the year but at the same time does not damage our unique ecosystem right there is a difference between the availability of water and the management of water resources so your question falls within the area of the management of water resources because without going into a lot of details, the availability of the water is there. I have a map that was done in the old days, the old systems. I have about 50, 50 or 70 maps of South Sudan that were all drawn by the British between 1920, 21, 23, and until independence in 1956. And uh, in one of them, if you look at it, and I have a snapshot of that in one of my slides in the presentation, wherever you look, there is water in South Sudan. There is a tributary. And if you want to enumerate the Khor and the seasonal rivers and even the flowing rivers, there are probably 300, 400 of them. The reason I said that it is not only the availability of water, but the spread 
of water over large areas of South Sudan. So let us park that part and let us agree that there is no problem about the availability of water. It is the management of water taking into account nature. For nature to be mastered, nature must be obeyed. This is what uh, Marx and Engels said and others. So our problem is not really with the availability of water, but with the management of that water. The management of water requires expertise. That expertise is not available in South Sudan now. So we have a knowledge gap. The other thing, we are not the only country in South Sudan where we have sporadic rainfall here and there, where we have cycles. The entire world has got that. Wherever you go, you will find that the, the entire environmental systems, even the, the ecosystems and the cycles have changed. The North Pole and the South Pole, ice is melting, oceans are rising. There is nothing we can do about that. What we can do about it is to manage that. And the simple question is, if the Blue Nile can have a dam in Sinar, and we can cultivate five, six million acres of land. What stops us from having water management and cultivating, be it in Western Equatoria, be it in Jungure Plains, and cultivating three, four, five million acres? So to answer your question, there is no scarcity of water there is no scarcity of land. There is no scarcity of land that can be cultivated by gravity, which is the least expensive way of cultivation on Earth. The Jazeera and Managil in northern in Sudan North are uh, on 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 on, uh, on gravity uh, irrigation. So, what is lacking in South Sudan now? is managing the water for the benefit of the country and for production, agricultural production, and other types of production. Going back to the animals, yes, uh, there are lots of animals. About 50, 55% of the population of South Sudan, the 11, 12 million people, they're either directly involved in pastoralism or dependent on pastoralism. Half the nation, and you are right, per capita, it is one of the highest rates of, of, of animals uh, on Earth. And there is a catch there because the cattle for the pastoralists is not for meat. The cattle is a currency. The dowry is paid in cattle. The compensation for crimes is paid in cattle. The wealth, the stature, if you don't have cattle, you are nobody. You all sack it. So, do, do we really want to disturb that? Do you want to disturb the system where cattle is a component? And the saying goes in South Sudan, people follow cattle, cattle does not follow people. You have to have water for the cattle every day. You have to have pasture in, in, in the route. That's why knowledgeable people build the hafirs in series. They span them every one or two days so that the cattle will stop. So there is an entire system in place. If the government of South Sudan wants to play with that, without knowing what they are doing, without having empirical evidence of benefits that will come out, they will be playing a game with the lives of their own people. Oh, brilliant. But you are saying if we are looking for uh, a, a, a holistic scientific solution for management of our water and for improving our agricultural pattern and production, there could be. Absolutely, provided, hmm. provided someone, president, vice president, the government, talks to a donor, be it USAID, be it the UN, be it Great Britain, be it the Nordic, the Nordic countries, to have a comprehensive uh, feasibility study uh, based on knowledge, unbiased, 
independent at arm's length from the executive so that we have some kind of evidence that if we do A and B and C, we are going to get positive results. And if there are any unintended negative impacts, this is the way we are going to deal with them. That's the kind of study I would like to see. You are talking about two years time, a team of probably 10 experts, maybe 300, 400, $450,000 dollars to do this kind of, of a study. Then the government of Sudan can build the water policies on the study and on the knowledge. The, yeah, the government of South Sudan. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. brilliant. Um, something came out of late, uh, two years ago, uh, research uh, in Edinburgh University traced a, a surge, a significant rise, like one-fifth rise in the emission of uh, methane to the Sud region. And I think, uh, I can't remember very well, but I think from what I've seen, the guess is it's not to do with animal emission, but it's to do with decomposition of plants underneath the, the, the suit itself. Now, uh, if South Sudan is producing tenth, one tenth or 20% of methane, and methane is the second most important, uh, potent uh, gas, uh, that contributes to global warming, then we, we have in our hands a global issue here. Yeah. With, with the whole world really having a vested interest in what's going on in South Sudan. Going back to what you were talking about, this, that the Sud region was part, was protected globally and is considered to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, an international area of interest. Doesn't this issue does it not present us an opportunity to do exactly what you are saying before? Because it seems to me that the solutions that are needed for South Sudan to solve its water resources problem uh, are at this stage uh, beyond the financial and scientific capacity of South Sudan. Uh, but uh, South Sudan can contribute uh, in many other ways, including, uh, of course, it has a sovereignty over the land. Uh, my question is, doesn't this present us an opportunity in which South Sudan can collaborate with the concern organizations around the world in, in finding this solution, which could hopefully lead to the reduction of methane, but out of it also, South Sudan can get all the things that are enumerated earlier, earlier, uh, earlier in terms of the distribution and the, and the constant availability of, of water when it's needed. This requires what we call in studies a holistic approach. You, we cannot take one part and leave the others. We need to be careful about unintended negative impacts of having a project, but it has negative impacts that we were not aware of, and hence we did not address them. So the first piece of advice, the first step to do is to think through a holistic approach whereby all the disciplines are brought in and a study is done. Then we come to funding. If you want to do a nationwide uh, study like that, evidence-based, unbiased, professional, uh, you need money. I was talking to a friend from Carter Center without mentioning names. And I brought this, this issue and other issues. And I told him in my conversation that, Mr. X, I know that there is donor fatigue now regarding South Sudan. And he turned around and he said, no, it's not only donor fatigue. There is compassion fatigue. And compassion fatigue is far worse than donor fatigue. Because compassion fatigue, it means that the people are even losing the sympathy for the situation they are, they are in. So it, it, it is a difficult situation, actually, to do a holistic approach, evidence-based uh, research of that wide, to talk about the missing, to talk about how to control it, uh, to come to conclusions, is it actually the digestive 
process of the cattle or is it the rotting uh, plants in the beds of the river uh, you need you need empirical evidence for for such things and empirical evidence some parts of the suit are inaccessible you need to drop by helicopter and and, and you need to be in water gear to be able to go anywhere there are no roads the, the boats cannot go so the inaccessibility is actually a very big uh, problem however it is doable if tomorrow the united nations in cooperation with the united states for argument's sake in cooperation with norway i mean norway did a lot of good for south sudan and the hilda johnson was uh, behind if there was one person that should get maximum credit for the cpa and the independence of south sudan it is hilda johnson but Hilda Johnson was booed down and was literally sacked from South Sudan at a later stage. However, I think the Norwegians still have quite a bit of sympathy for the people of South Sudan. It requires money, five, six, seven, eight million dollars. It's not a fortune, it is doable. And then you require a multidisciplinary team so that all the issues that we have been talking about, all the reservations, the positive and the negative, the uh, uh, the immediate and the and, and, and the trajectory, so that they can be put in a comprehensive document, on which you can build your water policies after that. Oh, that's really brilliant! I really thank you so much, uh, Doctor Attach. Um, uh, I just give you some minutes. Maybe there are a few things that you might you might have wanted to speak about uh, to speak about, which we have not been able to raise. Right. The first thing is drawing the listeners' attention to go into their laptops and Google Lake Chad, C-H-A-D. They will find photographs, pictures. There is a picture that you find anywhere where there are like two images, one of them of Lake Chad in 1964. The other image is Lake Chad in 2020. The size of Lake Chad in 2020 is only 5% of Lake Chad in, 2064, in 1964. 95% of the water was lost. There is also a place called the Aral Sea, A-R-A-L. The Aral Sea is between Kazakhstan and Ubiskan. This is these are the southern parts of, of the Soviet Union. That Aral Sea completely disappeared. Does not exist. So the possibility, because we cannot go up and have a word with God, what are you going to do next? That's 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 not feasible for us. You never know what the ecosystem, the global ecosystem will do. So when you have water. You don't play games with it. You never know if Lake No area will be like Lake Chad. You never know if the Sobat Valley, which is a very widely spread valley and you have all the Mashar, Mashar swamps are in that area. You never know what happens to it in another 20 years. One other point I wish to share with you or before that, could could sure. could the could the uh, proposed um, dredging of of Barazal River, which the minister spoke about, could it lead to the scenario that you are mentioning now? Yes, absolutely. Or could absolutely. you explain? There is water on the surface of the ground, and there is water underneath underground water. The underground water is two components. When you are drilling a well, we differentiate between the borehole and the deep bore. The borehole, which you find in many of our villages in South Sudan, this is rain that pours on top, it seeps through, and then it settles at the depths of about 30, 40 feet. So you drink, you drill a borehole and you can get probably about 10 gallons per minute, something like that, enough to water the village, to water the animals and the people. 
and then there is the deep bore where you go to the aquifer. And if you look at the geological map of South Sudan, there is a famous series called Umrawaba series. In Umrawaba series, if you dig underground, you will get water. Uh, probably uh, 200 gallons per, uh, per minute, water will come coming out. There are only certain areas in South Sudan where you have Umrawaba series. The underground water is fed from the overground water. I mean, there, there are no clouds <laughs> underground. So the rainfall at the top is the feeder, is the main feeder for the underground uh, water. And this is a factor of the surface area. The more area you have where rain is falling, the more seepage will happen and the more underground water you will have. So if you drain, then you are missing that component of feeding the underground water at these, at these two, uh, two levels. So we need to be careful about that. The other thing is why drain the water off into the Nile? You can always have artificial lakes. If you want to drain the water, if you want to direct the floods, all you need is a team of 20, 25 caterpillar machines of different types, and you can have 10 reservoirs of artificial lakes. You stir the water if you want it, you pump it out. You can have uh, a pastoralist uh, watering around these lakes. So there are other solutions other than losing the water. Our fight really and our stand should be that the water does not belong to any one minister or any one president or any one uh, ministry. That this is the, the water security of the people of South Sudan. So when Let the minister said that dredging will Im improve river navigation, it's not true. It's nothing to do with river no navigation. There is no river navigation in Bahr al-Ghazal Basin. What is he talking about? Who is the, who? Who has been taking the river at any point? There was an old uh, detour into Shambi. I don't know if you remember where Shambi is. There was an old detour of the boats into Shambi, but that was seasonal when the river is high. The the mobility of the people in South Sudan is not the main modus operandi. The the the, the main way of getting from A to B is not by river. And because of these marg marshes separating Bahr al-Ghazal from the Eastern Nile and the main Nile, there is no movement in there. And you do not drain your water. Where does the water go? Okay, you want, let us support it improves navigation. What is the cost? You don't want to improve navigation and lose water. That will be a very stupid trade-off. Because the water will go to Lake Noor and from there into the White Nile. Into the White North Nile. Sudan and Egypt. Abs absolutely. And we have got to be careful about this. And, and you are saying before about 4 billion, 4 to 5 billion cubic meters a year. And, and that there is no lake in Lake, lake Noor. It is a collection point and then the water flows. So any dredging in Bahr al-Ghazal Basin, any of the tributaries, the water comes into Lake Noe, it is lost. It goes into the Nile, you cannot control it. I don't think that anybody would want that. No. Yeah. That's, that's Probably a last thing is a piece of advice for our listeners. I'm a believer in the power of one. We should not be discouraged because we are not ministers. We should not be discouraged because we are not presidents. Jesus Christ was one. There are no two Jesus Christ. Until he was crucified, he stuck by his message. Muhammad was one. Moses was one. John Garang was one. And I will tell you how John Garang joined uh, the Anania. After he graduated, he came to Joe Lago, Joseph Lago. 
and he said, I want to join. And he identified himself. So Lago said, you know, you, you are an intelligence, you are an educated man. You go with us, uh, Lawrence Woolwell, go to Europe and advocate there. He said, sir, the action is here. He said, look, I am not going to give ranks to anyone that comes to me from a university. And he said, sir, I am not going for a rank. All I want is a uniform and a gun. Goodness gracious. That's the leader. That is... That's why he became a leader. So, and John Garang, I used to go and spend my nights with him in Busari when they were camped in Busari, and General Tajasir al Magbul was in Green Tea. And uh, he was such a humorous fellow. And he's a strategist. He was one of the few people in East Africa that could differentiate between the strategic and the tactical. One time the late, <coughs> the late Martin Maniel, Martin Maniel, if people are to be done right, Martin Maniel should have a statue in the middle of Juba. Martin Maniel came to be in the Addis Hilton and he said, the CNC would like to see, to see you. I said, fine, when he said, 12 o'clock midnight. Are you crazy? Why do I go to Young Garang at 12 o'clock? He said, Dad, you have got two options. You either say yes or you say no. So I went to a Gion hotel where he was staying. And uh, he was there sharp on time. He loved a glass of cognac. So he opened the bottle, he poured it for me. And then we discussed issues that, 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 that he wanted to discuss. I wouldn't go into them. And in about one hour after one hour, he said, do you have anything you want to ask? I said, yes. You are talking about New Sudan. You are talking about the United Sudan. And if I leave your room and I go to the lobby, your people will say something different. So he laughed and he had a sip from the cognac. And he said, Taj Mangistu gives me from the needle, and he pointed his finger, from the needle to the tank. And he developed Gambella Airport so that he supplies me with illusion Russian airplanes that are bringing the supplies. And he is fighting a separatist movement in Eritrea. How do you want me to say that I want to separate South Sudan? Taj, you are an intelligent man. You should differentiate between what is strategic and what is tactical. The man always, there was not a minute in his life where he had any doubt that he wanted a separate and independent South Sudan. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Taj. Uh, it's just incredible. Uh, I think I'm not going to let you go until you told us more about yourself, maybe a little bit about where you were born, where you lived, your experience with South Sudan, and, and, and now your, your career in retirement for the benefit of the audience. Right. I was, I was born in Omdurman, uh, October 15th, 1938, so I am 83 years old now. Oh, incredible. Yeah. You don't look it, if I must say. <laughs> at, least you your mind doesn't show, at least your mind doesn't show any <laughs> indication of it. Thank you very much. And I always joke with my friends who say something like that. I remind them of Johnny Walker whiskey. The, <laughs> in the bottle, you say, born in 1820 and it's still going strong. <laughs> and I tell them that Johnny Walker is my grandfather. So, <laughs> so uh, but I lived a bit more than 20 years of my life in South Sudan. My first encounter was in 1972 when I built the Blue Nile Brewery in Wow. Okay. And I built 100, I designed, surveyed, designed and built 130 half years in Greater Upper Nile. And I was an advisor to a brother Coleman Young in Boer and uh, my son Manawa, Peter Jatkot. Peter Jatkot was a very close friend of mine, hired by the World Bank I was his advisor for about one year in Bor. 
and I was advisor to engineer Isaac Liabwell at the Ministry of Water Resources for about six or seven months, again, hired by the World Bank uh, for him. I was arrested by the Sudanese security and detained 11 times. Most of it, they would take me to Port Sudan prison for periods of three to four or five months. During the Nimeri regime? During the Nimeri regime and during Bashir regime. For one reason, because I have cordial relationship with my brothers from South Sudan. That's it. That's, I am a Jesus. I am a spy. As long as they come to my home, absolutely. As long as they come to me and uh, to my home, then I am a spy. One very bad one was, there was a, a, a pilot called Peter. I forgot the second name. This, the pilot Peter is married to the sister of Ma Ma Maulana. Uh, he used to be the chief justice. Uh, he's from Bahr al-Ghazal. Ambrose, anyway, Ambrose Ring. Ambrose Ring. Ambrose, mm. How can I forget Ambrose Ring? Yeah. He's married to his sister. And he was in, uh, in, in Ethiopia and his family was supposed to join. The wife and the kids, I have got photographs with them. Mm. I managed to get them passports. Clement Ganda, Father Clement Ganda, chickened out. He gave me the file. He came to me at night and he said, Taj, I cannot do that. So I managed to get them passports. I managed to get them exit uh, visas. And I managed to convince a senior police officer to stand until they're actually in the plane. Mm -hmm. And they got into the plane. Somebody leaked it. And I was put in jail for three months. And I never, I never gave the name of the second person. I said, well, I went, I, I asked for the passport. They gave me the passport. The, I asked for the visa. Yes, I did it. However, nobody told me not to do it. So when they did not have any evidence after three months, uh, they released me. Regrettably, the same pilot was in Turit during the last assault. He was captured alive and he was killed in cold blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I go a long way with South Sudan. I am the same badge with Barnaba Dumuwani, his old bit Kajukaji. Yeah. Engineer Barnaba, he's the first civil engineer, qualified civil engineer in South Sudan. We spent six years together uh, at the, in the university. And uh, also a good number of people from uh, Dink and Gog. Mm. Dr. Francis Deng, it's the same batch. He went to law, I went to engineering. But the last two years, we were in the same hostel at the University of Khartoum. And I went with him to his village in the Ngog area. I, I probably visited every place you can think of, probably 90% of South Sudan. Sure. I am the citizen of Oror County. It is my second home, and UI is the second town for me, and Lankin is the second town for me. I will probably close on a note that may be important for all of us. The multi donor trust fund that was given by the international donors to South Sudan was 1.2 billion cubic meters. Cubic, uh, 1.2 mm -hmm. billion dollars, dollars yeah. other than the oil revenue. And if you go out of Juba, there is nothing. All that money did not actually help the people of South Sudan. When I was advising Coleman Young, he asked me to go out and survey what do the people want? What are their priorities? This so is I after think. the CPA. This is after the CPA. Mm -hmm. After the CPA, this was 2009, 2010. He yeah. was the governor of, uh, of Yungule. That's right. So I took two cars. He wanted to give me a Harris guard. I said, no, that, that could cause trouble. I went on my own in two cars, my staff and myself. I went to seven payams of the 11 in Yungule at that time. And I had a simple question. 
what is your top priority if tomorrow the government wants to do service for you? What is the top priority? And in all the seven payams, the top priority was to have a qualified midwife in every village. That was not even in my wildest dreams. I, you never, we never stopped to learn. And I said, why? He said, well, because until now, we draw the child with the rope, so either the child dies or the mother dies. And in Iwai, there were 17 community leaders. <clears throat> so I said, who among you lost a newborn or a mother during birth? They all raised their hands. Yeah. <clears throat> midwife so I worked hard with the Americans with the Canadians and they funded and built a midwife training center in Lankin during the war and the split of Riyak Mashar the soldiers raided the place and destroyed it completely after 2013 yeah. so the government of South Sudan needs to look at the priorities. We cannot be talking about children and women dying because of the lack of a midwife. And we want to build a canal for the Egyptians. That's high treason. That's high treason, my brother. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Tagal Khazin. Uh, we are so honored and uh, so pri so privileged to have to have had you today. Thank you very much, and we'll talk again. Sure, absolutely, any time. Thank Take you. Care. Thank bye you, bye. Thank you sure. so much, Doctor. Thank sure. you. Sure. Bye bye.